every piece of art and decision in the game is painting a truth of the lore. When we were doing early Halo production and pre-production, we were really struggling to figure out what the game was. The question is always figuring out how to get people to your narrative temples. How do I get to an introduction? How do I get people to the establishing shot intro and when the protagonist has grabbed the camera and runs away? Because I don't think you and I have talked very much about your Battlefield 1 experience. You were doing narrative direction there. I was in the wrong at the time. I was like, there's no way. That's terrible. Nobody's going to want to watch <laughs> Anthology. That that's garbage! What was a 12-beat story, Brian, that was like maybe six or seven is all that got out. They just wow. cut the scope and you're like... They cut it in half, basically. Writers will come into games being like, I'm gonna write The Last of Us, and they end up people going, Grenade! Grenade out! <laughs> Get down! Take cover! Chuck, here we are once again. Thank you for joining me. Hello, Brian. Good to be here. <laughs> I'm very excited to always be with you and chat about games and narrative. Talking about nerd stuff. Nerd stuff. So for those who may have not seen, Chuck and I have done several videos together talking specifically about Dead Space. Chuck is a writer and producer of Dead Space 2, Dead Space 3, and all of the Dead Space transmedia. And you also were a producer on Dead Space 1. But the thing that we haven't talked about is all of our other escapades and how we met each other and why we've worked together and also just our shared experiences in game narrative because there's a lot outside of Dead Space that you've been a part of as well and it'd be kind of fun to talk through your adventures I guess in, in games. That's the politest way <laughs> to have said that. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, so actually I think it'd be fun to just say how you and I actually cross paths. Um, Gosh, how many years ago was that? That's like a that a line in the beginning of any bad movie. Yeah. How long has it been? <laughs> how long has it been? <laughs> yep, that's me. You're you probably know, wondering Bob, how I got here. You're, you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're probably wondering how yeah, I got here. With the record that's scratch. A barely, barely hidden exposition. Yeah. Well, we met at Electronic Arts. I had come to LA and then I moved back up to San Francisco to work on the Amy Hendrix Star Wars game. Yeah. And you were there and had been bugging probes, for, I think, for a position. Yeah. I think your tenacity paid off. So that was one of my first jobs in games. So I was, I had, my first job in games was an intern at uh, Madden at EA. Um, and I was working on Longshot, which was the first ever story mode they did. And I was working oh, with Mike gosh. Young and Rob Cowie. Um, and they were so awesome. And basically, that whole internship was we would travel around the country and into Vancouver as well, working with actors, doing motion capture just talking, doing basically like on a shoestring budget, the first ever Madden story mode. Um, I'm not a huge football guy, but and so when I joined, I was like a little skeptical. I'm like, how useful am I going to be? But it was awesome. It was super fun. And those guys were super awesome to work with. Um, and I love motion capture. I love working with actors and I love game narrative, clearly. Um, and so that was a really, really cool foray into games. Um, and then I had my my graduate school, Carnegie Mellon, had like a little satellite campus at EA's headquarters in San Francisco. Mm. And so I was finishing up my graduate degree there, and I knew Scott Probst, who was the GM of Visceral at the time, just with like mutual connection. And so when I was about to graduate, um, I was hearing from the Madden crew, like those guys were like, hey, Brian, it'd be great to have you. And I was like, this would be awesome to work with these guys. But I knew that you know, the Star Wars game is going on with Amy Hennig. And I was like, I want to work on that. Like, as much as I love the guys on Madden, like, I was just like, I, working on Star Wars, like Amy Hennig Star Wars game would be like a dream come true for me. Um, so then I would just email probes, like, every couple of weeks. and be like, hey, man, do you, like, want an intern? I'll do whatever you want. It'd be super cool. <laughs> um, and so then eventually, like, it was basically almost down to the day where, like, I was about to graduate and Madden was like, you got to give us a yes or no. And then Scott was basically like, all right, I think we can have a position for you. And he's like, you're going to be working with this guy named Chuck Beaver. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, that's funny. What's, what's his actual name? Yeah, I was like, huh, interesting. Well, the funny thing is, too, I told you, I like looked you up on LinkedIn. <laughs> and I see Chuck. I see his, his face. And, I, and I, I saw that he's like, he's like a writer on Dead Space. And I'm like, okay, he's like this like marine looking tough guy. And I thought I was going to meet you. And you're like... Yeah, uh, do tattoo, by the way. By the way, hello, Side <laughs> <of> Cosmo. <laughs> Look at him. Look at that guy. It's, it's pretty badass. I'm pretty pleased. It's pretty good. <laughs> Go see Andri Rubachinko at Nautilus Tattoo Studio. Um, and get your own Cosmo Get your today. own Cosmo. <laughs> Sunset in Fairfax. You'll have this wonderful <coughs> providence of a tattoo that got to you out of L.A. And yeah, he's great. He did exactly the line art that I wanted. 
but I saw you on LinkedIn and I thought I was going to meet you and you're like, yeah, you know, I worked on Call of Duty and Dead Space and I like to yeah. do shooters and stuff. And I meet you and you're like, hello. Hello, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> we immediately started goofing around in the studio. Like we were, me- we were like fast goofball friends. Yeah, it was awesome. It was hard to be serious. Actually, we were mostly giggling the whole time. So well, you were also one of the first people to get me into fitness as well. Like I had been working out kind of lightly before um, and then you got me into CrossFit for a little bit. We would work really? out together. I didn't yeah. realize that you hadn't been training pretty seriously up to that point. I would train, but it was it was just kind of like, you know, I'd go to the gym and move stuff around. Like, I was, like, in decent shape, but I wasn't in, like, really good shape. And so then you and I would work out together basically every day. And you taught me a lot about just, like... Do you remember the entire saga of the deadlift? Yeah, that exactly. Was so good. Because the deadlift requires a little bit of a of a flex down so your ass engages yeah. and you were having you were struggling with the motion and you would try it once you'd be like <laughs> run off and I'm like it's okay come back you'll literally get it I was so it. mad it's because I couldn't figure out the mind muscle connection because I'm sitting playing video games all day for the, my entire life and then I remember one day it was either deadlift or squat I was like I felt my ass <laughs> it worked it did it I did the thing I'm like I saw it it's amazing yeah. good job and now you deadlift like what do you do like two four like four hundred and fifty yeah like five hundred pounds yeah four fifty five hundred pounds that's extremely abnormal that's it's like point one percent of people can do I can't even deadlift that much it's pretty fun start deadlifting deadlifting is a good plan um, if you can do it good so Brian is an amazing bodybuilder now like he got serious about. After we parted companies after a visceral close, then you went off and, and bodybuilded really yeah. hard. Oh, during the pandemic. Yeah. It's all you did. Well, it's basically, so I, so visceral shut down, which we can talk about, because you left visceral before it shut down, but I was there for the reckoning. Yeah, um, just before I'd gotten, I'd been sort of uh, courting Riot for many years. Yeah. <laughs> and that finally came through. Um, and then also my, I was, there was health problems inside my family that I had to leave the studio to go attend during that time. So I took the opportunity to kind of dip for a bit, do that, and then go to Riot. Yeah. Um, but then I, so after Visceral shut down, I went off to Seattle to work on Halo. So I saw Halo Infinite all the way through production, doing character and narrative production. But when I was there, so my good buddy Dan, who I think I've done a couple videos with on this channel as well, he's a really talented coach and, you know, very talented bodybuilder. And he, I called him up and I was like, hey, I used to work out with my buddy Chuck. And like, now that I don't have someone to work out with, um, can you just like do like remote coaching for me? Just, just to work on my CrossFit form. And so he's like, yeah, like send me some videos. And so I showed him some videos. He's like, I think we just need to work on general strength. So let's just do like a couple weeks of general strength. And so we're just going to do bodybuilding stuff. I'm like, okay, that doesn't sound that fun, but I'll do it. And like a month later, I'm like, <laughs> Your genetics are stupid. Your body, your muscle belly genetics are really, really suited to I was super lucky. And so then I was just like, just kidding. I want to do this now. <laughs> You're like, this is great. I'm just going to do this. This yeah. is fun. And then I just, well, you, the CrossFit was always sort of okay for you. You hated things like wall balls. You would just get red face and be like, why are we doing these? And yeah. I'm like, CrossFit? Yeah. <laughs> it's just what you do. That's what we do. I don't know. Yeah. Really. But anyway, so the super long story short, yeah. that's how you and I met. And so we worked together. It was probably only something like six or it seven months. It was eight or so months. We yeah. were there working on it. We were both working on the cinematics for that. We yeah. directly with Amy and all that crew and yeah. Colin. And I was the liaison to Lucas Arts, Lucas yeah. Film through that. Yeah, yeah. That was our that was our foray into that. Yeah. It was quite fun at the time. But that was my my first foray into games and but you've had a pretty extensive career and before that obviously with things like dead space um but then you also where did, what was your first game that you worked on was it james no james i was a internet consultant working in the dot-com boom mm-hmm. in san francisco from 99 to 2001 and as that was disintegrating <laughs> i had a friend who worked at ea and hr and i was like got anything he's like well what can you do? <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm working with a consultancy and I know like production and, and client requirements, business requirements and software. He goes, oh, that's production. Come over and do low, you know, do art management for Freak Show. Yeah. Freak Style. Freak Style was a skateboard game. Oh, so that was your first one. So Page 44 Studios down in downtown San Francisco. I was just helping manage that and I just doing art management stuff. Really easy. Yeah. AP, associate producer work. And then left for a bit because that wasn't a full-time gig. And then my real job disintegrated completely because I was in like a hiatus for six months. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to my friend at HR and and I was like, how about something real? He's like, okay, come do localization for James Bond. Mm -hmm. It was Nightfire, James Bond. Yeah. That was... Talk about a perfect introduction to video games. It was torturous. So like I was there <laughs> managing spreadsheets and like hundreds, you know, thousands of assets. Like, did these come in? Did these go out? What's the status yeah. of these? And you've got, you just, localization is just this 
hairball. Yeah. And then I ended up having to go to London to finish it. And I remember this. I got so sick. I went over for like a week to finish because we were working with Eurocom. It ended up being four weeks and I had to stay. And I'm <laughs> sitting there at breakfast in this little hotel in Eurocom. <coughs> and I don't know if you spent any time over in the the Shire-like fields of Britain. I've never been there, no. Dude, it's the Shire. Literally, yeah. it's these dewy fields. And the dew would settle and there was apparently... I don't know how many thousand heads of sheep and cattle around. And the smell of manure would waft oh, no. in. And I'm eating my eggs going, do my eggs taste like manure? <laughs> That's, that can't be true. And it's like, I'm just smelling all this. So it was a very like fragrant place. Um, but it was like, we were just there. And all we had was like any food pizza and something else to just order yeah. constantly. People brought in their cots. They were sleeping. And it oh, was like, wow. I was like, I couldn't train for four weeks. And my body was like, gee, 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 gee. yeah. And it was like, it was a typical crunch, 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 crunch. That's not, that is the perfect example of like what it would be like to crunch, which is like, not only is it hard, you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well, you're just crammed together, but also it smells like shit. Yes, also <laughs> breakfast, and for extra bonus, yeah. your eggs smell like cheap manure. Yeah, like, oh, very cool. I love this job. So that was the first one, Freak Style, fun skateboard game and then I got into the Bond franchise as producer on pre-production for Everything or Nothing Yeah, and you know how games of the Wild West like you know this um, where you currently are is a little bit like you can kind of move into positions you shouldn't be Yeah, and like I'm like hey I can do level design and so I was helping out with like the last levels of Everything or Nothing have some of my ideas in them that's kind of cool. What? Yeah, but why are you <laughs> saying anything, young first person? Just show I'll just do it. Yeah, and people are like, sounds like a good idea, and we just work with it. Kasper Sinkowski, one of my favorite people on earth, was there, and he and I were having a fun time working on stuff together, and uh, he's over at um, Sledgehammer now. And, oh, cool. Um, yeah, it's a good group. Um, and I was just, I was involved with everything. I was like, UI and all this other stuff. So I got straight into game software production as a producer on that. Then did the James Bonds, and I did that one, and then we did... Um, Oh, wait, Nightfire? And then, oh, it was Everything or Nothing, which was our own story. So it was my first experience with watching game story pre-production happen. We did For Much With Love. Mm -hmm. That's hard because you take an existing movie script and try to make it into a game. Oh, so that was where you were taking, basically trying to do film or game ad adaptation of a film. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Never do that. Well, I feel like that was really popular back in like the early 2000s. Like anytime there was a movie that came out, it'd be like, hey, and here's the game version of it. Yeah, like you yeah. said, they would kind of just copy, try to copy paste the script into it. Well, sometimes well, it would work, but I feel like a lot of times. Well, now it was... you know a lot about both those media, and you know yeah. there's no relationship between the structure of a movie and the structure yeah. of a game. Like it's just, I mean, narratively there is a. <clears throat> if you back up enough, like down the genetic tree, you find the nematode from which all life. Comes from. <laughs> Same with narrative, yeah. right? But it's, it gets really divergent pretty quick, and so we just we made it, we made it work, and you find ways to do it. But it's hard to honor the DNA of a movie flow in a store in a in an interactive game. It's just yeah. there's a lot of challenges. Um, so you were at this point you were just kind of adjacent to game narrative but you were kind of observing it you were not directly producing and writing I was actually directly producing it at this oh, point oh you were okay. yeah because I was always involved right after everything or nothing and I was kind of involved helping that story after the new story came down it needed to get into level design so I was producing all of that so I saw how story became game level design mm -hmm. and then for much with love i was directly responsible for helping translate that screenplay into level design i mean i wasn't doing the level design but that was my production design so we were all working with how are we going to do it working with the creative director um and that was really you know we got that out and that was when all <laughs> the was going on so like they asked that was glenn Schofield was uh, i think being asked to do that game and they were going to ask him to do another one, but in a shorter time frame. Because you know how big corporations are? They're like, that was pretty good. <laughs> two years. Can you do it in a year? Because yeah. they don't know. Yeah. They have no idea. And you're like, that was torturous to do it in two years. There's no way we can do it unless. And Glenn was not willing to sign up for another one. But he was able to wrangle Dead Space out of VA because they were going into new IP at that time. They're like, yeah. And they were like, oh, this bond license is too expensive. Let's get rid of this thing. And let's make something cool. So Mirror's Edge, Dead Space, Dante's all came from that sort mm -hmm. of urge. And so then they sort of picked all of their people they knew from both the Bond and the James and the Lord of the Rings teams and put together Dead Space. And I got to be on that, mm -hmm. again, helping with pre-production, world building, all the level design, all the narrative, all the story. I did everything in the Dead Space 1. And the UI, I ran the UI team, and I was mm -hmm. also running some level design stuff. And then and this was more of a producer than a creative at this time, right? Well, at that time, we were pitching ideas. Like, Stasis is basically, I sort of... That's right, yeah. was yeah. kind of the one, like, I don't know how I was, how I felt, like, 
But you okay. said you said you were playing City of Heroes a lot. Of the I time, was. Right? <laughs> and it's, tell me if you think this is true. Like, is it true now? Like, if you think about League of Legends, like all the um, all the ADCs and all the mages have a control spell or something to gain control of the situation. It's and you can't use it all the time. But yeah. you're not just a complete glass cannon, but you have a piece of CC god control. Yeah. God control. And I thought that was standard. That was what was true with the Blasters and, and City of Heroes. Like, I'm yeah. like, they all have a control a control spell to help manage the situation. And I was like, why don't we have one of these in here? Because <laughs> you don't have that in shooters, right? Like in Halo, in yeah. Gears. It's just always just run faster, shoot faster, right? Cover is your cover, yeah. is your CC. And then you come out and get killed and by a 13-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else is to That's happen? what happens. Uh, and so I was like, well, yeah, of course. You just put this cool thing in, this stasis thing. And I remember the credit director at the time, was, of course, he was a shooter purist. And he was like, what? Why yeah. would we do this? And I was like, ah, oh, be cool. Come on, it'll be sci fi stuff. And we sort of did it. And I don't even know how I managed to keep stumping for it that it got in. But I think I sold it on the idea that, you know, the new, not new class, but there is a, a way of thinking in games where, you know, the glass cannons have something to protect them besides cover. Yeah. And that became a stasis. And I remember even we were like not clear how to use it for a long time. And I was like, well, you tune for it. Yeah. So you make the encounter hard enough that you do need some CC. Yeah. Because if it was pure shooter, you would have mitigated the pressure of yeah. the AI so that you could just use and survive and just cover and pop out. Yeah. But we didn't. I was like, make it, make it harder. And then you had different creative, <clears throat> great creative problems. And that's why you had the really fast running guys, right? There were their stasis right. units malfunctioned and all that that we talked about. Dude. And... For anybody wanting to make a stasis game and a puzzle game, good luck. Like uh, it's, we struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled through all the dead spaces to make really good stasis puzzles. Somehow it was incredibly challenging. But anyway, that was so that was all dead space, and then it just went from there. And then yeah. we did Dead Space Two. Um, first year pre-production on that wasn't great. We were kind of struggling with some of the creative, um, and then of course. Uh, the whole thing happened when Glenn went to to Sledgehammer with all those people. Mm-hmm. Um, half basically half the team went with them to go, leaving us. And then Ben Monat and I got handed creative control of the of Dead Space Two. So we spent a lot of time kind of cleaning up the lore and like, okay, what this doesn't make sense, and that doesn't make sense. And you know this from when we played through <laughs> on the remake. I'm the entire time just going, uh, sorry, Joe Barry, about <laughs> this. We left you this mess. We yeah. left you that mess. It wasn't perfectly clean. Yeah, but it was a huge lesson in how. Um, to do world building stuff you might actually learn in like a college course at this point if you're taking narrative design there's definitely some pretty good world building courses and like narrative design courses even on YouTube and stuff for free um, but it, you it's hard to know unless you actually do it and you guys were into the fire immediately where it's like hey here's a AAA franchise <laughs> learning on the spot and not, that doesn't happen like in movies you don't like run onto a certain like I've never written a script before but hey here's yeah. what I think and you're like <laughs> What and so, but it's we had some experience at that point. We had done all Dead Space One and we had done lots of stuff before that, but like trying to wrangle that lore. And now it seems so like now that we've done it for so long, like it seems so obvious. Like, well, don't make things more complicated Mm -hmm. to solve them because that is the problem, right? Simplify, simplify, simplify. You have to have a tower of logical cause and effect chain, yeah, that everything hangs off of like a Christmas tree, and it can support infinite weight if it's solid and simple, yeah. But what you can't support is infinite weight if it's scattered. It's like, think about like a pose you've got that's just all stretched out, it's just gonna fall over. And if you have a bunch of and then in there, and you have just oh, but this happens in exceptions and rules, like that forms a hairball that yeah. was what. Well, we did. We had right. hairball stuff. And I remember, and I'm now I'm not castigating anybody. I'm not castigating Brett or Glenn or anybody in yeah. Dead Space 1. But we kept adding kitchen sinks to it. Yeah. And I remember we had, because the very first thing Glenn wanted was like, okay, it's a criminal. It's a moon colony that houses criminals that has been corked. And they went rancid. Rancid moon. <laughs> right? That's rancid moon. And the Ishimura comes by and uncorks it. And all that gets out. All the bad gets out. Yeah. That was the original thing. And somehow from there, we ended up with, like, <laughs> right, the markers are man-made. Because yeah. I remember Brett thought of that at one point. I'm like, that sounds cool. And we just didn't really think about... How the pieces kind of finish. Like, every time, walking it out. Like, okay, yeah. what does that mean? And Brett was really good. He could go from, like, the beginning of an idea to the soup to nuts at the end. He was really, really talented at that. Um, like, you'd have an idea over here, and he's like, no, it messes this up. And you're like, okay. So for systems, he was really good at that. But somehow the lore ended up being a little bit... Um, kooky that way we had a few things that stopped making sense like there was a dead space field we started with yeah remember that mm-hmm. and there was like why was it in the pedestal we figured well if you unlocked it from the pedestal and EMP we kept adding things and EMP pulse went off <laughs> and we're like 
Okay. Why? And then that yeah. would shut off the the gravity tethers. So we were adding things to the lore to make a to solve for an immediate problem, which is not the way to do that. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. So that was just learning and learning and learning and learning and learning and then that's space one and two. Yeah. By the time we got to three, we'd sort of figured out how to keep the lore reasonably clean, and I'm really proud of the lore work in three. Um, less of the story work, but <laughs> <laughs> I think that's I think that's an interesting there's so many different needs for game writing that, like you said, where it's just kind of like, here's a cool idea. Cool, let's put that in. Here's another cool idea. Let's put that in. Here's another cool idea. Let's put that in. But in, like you said, the Christmas tree lights, if they don't connect to one another, when you finally put everything together, it's like, oh, this just doesn't, it's confusing. It doesn't really make sense. Like, how does this all fit together? And you can feel that as a as a viewer and as a, as a player. Do you um, think that's more prone to game design because the production is so it's a big you're doing an entire season of tv eight mm-hmm. to twelve episodes is one game if you're lucky at this yeah. point and like you're solving a problem in episode four that's an immediate in the weeds screenplay problem you're like let's just make this true and it happens that you've suggested a lore beat yeah or something that ricochets back to the lore like i think games are particularly prone to that because of the scope of the work you're doing yeah. and the intensity of the pressure to problem solve and suddenly you're like yeah we just made it where the markers you know make a thing over here yeah and it solves this problem immediately and gets going and unless you've got someone like cory barlog over at god of war keeping a lovely mm-hmm. like really excellent control of that thing that's a narrative product right, right. unless everyone knows that you to flags go off when you do that they won't and then you'll start adding you know pasting stuff into the lore that just make it sort of barnacled and fall apart yeah and that's where the world becomes un becomes unpredictable and understandable and therefore everything all your emotional um harvesting goes to zero because if i can't figure out how the world works then i can't worry about anything I'm right like, well i don't know maybe well, that's bad maybe that's good i don't and know what the stakes of the world are like you can't assess yeah. them it's certainly not in the way the narrative wants you to which is you need to have that top of mind as the as the as the audience player you're like oh i hope she doesn't go in there yeah and the reason you're worried about that is you have immediately logically put together that room equals this thread and this thing and this thing and she's in this state like all these complicated things need to very simply come together into that moment yeah and if you're busy barnacling up all those logical pieces where she's like well i don't know last time she used that spell who knows what happened it would they did this excuse and that excuse yeah so i think that's where like you're saying there's a lot of logical care that has to be taken of the world building the lore especially in games if you want to achieve those narrative outcomes right right and i think sometimes it it gets short shrift and if you don't build from the top down where you have an understanding of the world yeah. logically as opposed to a collection of decisions that have been made mm-hmm. that will never synthesize into what we're talking about a, exactly. a functioning narrative structure yeah and i think that it again it depends on where your game is in production and like what and not only where it is in production but also like what genre of game that you're trying to create right because Mm. a god of war is different from a league of legends which is different from a call of duty which is like all of these games have different narrative needs and narrative expectations based on what the player wants Um, so for example like league of legends lore is kind of a sprinkle you know it's been able to make you know arcane and things like that where you can spin these things out from the lore but you know Players just want to have a cool champion. Like, this, my champion does this cool thing, and I'm going to play it because it's a competitive <clears> game. So understanding the world and the beats aren't necessarily needed for a game like League of Legends or a Dota or something like that. But if you're playing a God of War or a Last of Us or whatever it is, it's like, no, the world and the narrative are extremely important. And being a writer on those means you have to, like you said, adhere to what is happening in here like if you know if a you know not that a writer would do this but if a writer showed up and was like oh i made in god of war i made uh kratos has tentacles now because that's cool or what i don't know it's a stupid example but right it's it's being able to like you said synthesize how this will fit in and also how it moves the story forward based on the narrative goals everything you're saying is true and like every piece of art and decision in the game is painting a truth of the lore Mm -hmm. like it's not they're randomly like yeah. it's not like well i came up with this cool idea you're like well is it of the world is it of that character's arc or the, yeah. his origin or her origin or like is it adding to the narrative stack of meaning that's going on and a lot of times the answer is no <clears throat> yeah. even in narrative products 
But man, MOBA, I don't need that. I yeah. you don't even need I don't even need the scratch and sniff settings. Yeah. I call that like think of Elden Ring, how excellent that is. Mm-hmm. There's not necessarily a hardcore main forward story, but you get the story by encountering the aftermath of the lore in right. the world and you understand and put together satisfyingly what happened in Elden Ring. Right? Yeah. That's kind of scratch and sniff. But they've thought through that. They have a whole lore and there's a Yeah, they, they know, you know, the, surely they have a <clears throat> world bible somewhere that's you know, <laughs> just like here's everything that has happened. Yeah. Now we're going to play little nuggets for players to find that can piece together this lore even if it's not one to one like a lot of players really love that where they're like it's open ended we're like oh I think that this means this like I've literally been at lunch with friends where they're like okay did you see the the new Elden Ring trailer it was this there was a statue of a snake and that means that it was this god and so they're like piecing these things together and that they think that's really enjoyable I'm not a huge fan of of Elden Ring so I can't (laughs) but let's talk about that let's unpack the fact that that is often missed as the point of world building and level design and narrative yeah. and there are some people who want to just put cool things in a game they think yeah. that what the reverse engineering from their favorite parts of movies and TVs and films and games are the flashy highlight moments and if you just have enough of those that's it it's like it's saying cool. like you know everything is just spectacle yeah and not substance and they don't get that there is an entire process that is to build up so that there is substance to the spectacle. Yeah. Right? Spectacle isn't story. Even the folks who have been in it for so long, these people who have tons of narrative experience, it's never perfect. Like, they, we still get it wrong. Like, it's yeah. it's not like... It is... And you can say that about any anything, but I think, like you said, it is... Writing is particularly hard because everything needs to be in lockstep all the way through in order for it to resonate and land. Like what you set up in act one has to carry all the way through act two, all the way through act three, or even longer depending on the story you're doing. And it has to land perfectly for the audience. It's ne- it's it's not that you still may hit it out of the park with a well-crafted movie. Yeah. And it just may not resonate because the message that you're generating through this perfect piece of beautiful art, yeah. not for everybody. Nobody, nobody wants Requiem for a Dream even though it's a perfectly put together movie. Yeah. Right? And Westerns aren't for everybody, and Noir is not for everybody. Think of other movies like Prometheus is a great one to pick on. Yeah. That is just problems in the script. You don't even need to get it yeah. to, to screen to see where the problems and are. And that's that's, that's a good example too, where it's like Ridley Scott made Ridley Scott made Alien and Blade Runner, which are both like some of my favorite movies of all time. But then Alien getting... is like a masterpiece. Yeah. It's phenomenal. And then somehow under his tutelage this managed to come out and yeah. the shape it was. And I think that is a good example of right. Again, like the Christmas tree lights didn't connect. It's like, why are these decisions being made? I don't really understand what's happening in this story. Even with something, the world building of Alien, which has pretty strong world building with enough mystery, but then explaining almost too much of being like, well, now this is weird. Like we the aliens were made territory by the end. Yeah, the engineers. They, made, they started well. That movie just has script problems. And I bet it's like, especially if you're experienced on Halo, you know that when you get into production on something... Lots of stuff can happen, like mm-hmm. legal changes to the status of your IP. Yeah. And I know when they started Prometheus, they weren't like, this isn't going to be a prequel to Aliens. I don't yeah. know what they were going to do, but somehow it got lost and tossed in that tumble. I'm sure the script just got ripped and torn and was all these different things. But like, it just doesn't make sense in lots of different calls. So somebody who had the final call in those shots yeah. was just like, I mean, it was just, it was like the characters weren't doing things that made sense. So you were constantly ripped out of that movie. Like, okay, that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. The guy who's trying to seduce, or not seduce, the guy who's like treating the white cobra snake <laughs> yeah. thing as as a raccoon. He's uh. like, ooh, hey. You're like, I don't, that's not something humans would do. Yeah. And then Charlie's Throne told to run in a straight line while the thing is chasing really her in a straight really, line. Yeah. You're like, could you? <laughs> dodge like it's just endlessly problematic but the opening was so brilliant like the idea that there were some engineers that threw some black goo into the world biome of earth and then we got or they got aliens from that and who knows what happened with earth maybe something cool yeah it's, that's solid yeah but that's it was all very, very next it's like the existential where we come from fear which is good to what a fun into. fairy tale yeah. sci-fi fairy tale yeah that's really nice but I think that's where again world building like that world building was either not done all the way or was done and ignored or was somebody came in with Last minute script fixes. Okay, I got a. I'm a script doctor in Hollywood. I got to tighten this up. Yeah. And then they blow through all these lore holes or don't honor the lore holes because someone's over here pulling for action and someone's pulling for this. Yeah. So I, that happens. I'm sure that happens. Obviously, yeah. in Hollywood all the time. In games, it's a similar way. You've got. That's what happened to the Dead Space Three love story. Like there's supposed to be an entire sequence where Isaac and Robert um, Robert Gant's character Robert Norton mm-hmm. were bonding 
over there was a large section in the beginning where they were flying through some debris field and that's where they were like relying on each other under the duress of <laughs> death yeah. and they bonded then so that that would make more sense that they would have a falling out later but when you whole levels get cut and stuff happens and you're like mm. yeah. so in games I would argue someone always has to be there to cast narrative every day yeah. on it like this fell apart I'm casting narrative on again put it back this now is narrative again because yeah. it will fall apart I think that's one of the the when we were doing early Halo production and pre-production, we were really struggling to figure out what the game was. And I remember everyone was always just saying, "What is this game?" You mean like the game story or the game universe or well, the game genre? I mean, we knew it was Halo in the Halo universe. Like, there's a lot okay. we know about about Halo. But mm -hmm. I think the the struggle that we always have had on Halo was Halo is such a big game. It's actually like three games tied together. You have the Master Chief campaign story, you have the multiplayer story, you have the um, like player creation forge side, mm -hmm. um, you have the esports side, you have the social side. So like there's all of these different target audiences that you're trying to hit and basically all of these different products you're trying to mush together mm. into this one thing. And I remember um, again in early pre-production we were a lot of folks were really trying to struggle because the game was so big. Mm. We didn't really know where we were supposed to be pointed because a lot of people were pointed in different directions, like multiplayer is going to be pointed in a different direction than campaign and all of these different um, teams. But I remember still, even on campaign side, we're like, what are we trying to make here? Like, is 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 story going to be first for this? Is the gameplay going to be first? Like, mm. what is what are we doing? Was it not even coming from a thematic foundation overall? Like, all of these are expressions of this iteration of Halo? We did, we kind of kept having it, but we also had to keep scoping down mm. because obviously, hey, like, yeah, whoops, turns out everything that, always goes well when you scope down, yeah, right? Exactly. It turns out that you have a big idea and then you start making it and you go, oh, we have to make it smaller because we have to hit the deadline. And then, you know, you always have to keep turning the wheel. Well, remind me that I have a story about that. Um, but anyway, the, the long story short that I was going to say is I remember my boss at the time, Lanny Lum, just, I love her to death. She's super talented. Um, I think she's over it. Microsoft now, Microsoft Publishing. But she, um, I remember she was particularly frustrated because she's like, we're trying, like the team wants so hard to know what we're doing, but we feel like we're just confused about what we're actually trying to build here. Mm -hmm. um, and she said she watched a Walt Disney mm -hmm. documentary when he was making Snow White. And he's, they said that he would walk around the studio all day, every day, and he would just be at people's desks being like, this is the story. This is the story. This is what we're doing. This is why we're building it. Go to the next person's desk. Do you have any questions? This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And he made sure that in the event that he got hit by a bus, random schmo Joe animator over here knew exactly what they were building and why yeah. they were building it. Yeah. Um, and I think that speaks to really powerful direction, whether you're an art director, creative director, narrative director, whatever it is, being able to synthesize that information and put it in people's brains and that doesn't mean like here's a very robust world you know bible or here's a very robust powerpoint on our art goals it's like sitting with the people talking through what it may be reinforcing that direction giving clarity um, yeah. kind of like we were saying at the very beginning where it has to have that very clear and synthesized idea and then working with folks not that it can't change some people may have good feedback like oh you know we should change this about the story but it's being able to distribute that direction and, again, making sure that everyone on the team knows what they're doing. So then you can distribute responsibility so that folks right. can, like, they can make their own choices because they have a clear vision. But that's the whole, we were laughing about this earlier, that's what a director's job is. And yeah. I think if you're playing force multiplier director like that, you've, been, you've got a vision. Mm -hmm. You've been able, to, and being able to articulate it is the job. Yeah. And making sure the team has, in uh, like internalize that is also the job so if you're busy playing a game of well guess what's in my pocket yeah which is where there's not any articulated centralized design that you can say it's this kind of a razor of ideas this is a criteria we use for what belongs in and out of this game these are the emotional targets we're hitting these are the game type of targets we're hitting this is what the outcome is supposed to be mm -hmm. if you're not talking in those terms because you don't know them well get there like yeah. that's your job so if you can't do that and you're not doing that that's where you need to audit your own work and figure out oh, is this what we're doing and it's just called it on the rubric of focus yeah like that's what the most focused the only games i've been on that are successful are the ones that have been focused yeah and we had um and again halo was tough because we had uh my character director steve super talented guy we had our campaign director we had a multiplayer director we had a sandbox director like gameplay director 
So there's all these different directors that have all of these different products. Mm. Uh, we had our narrative director with like Dan Chositz and Paul Crocker. And so it was all of these different folks who were trying to be like, okay, I'm building this, but you're going to build this, but I'm building this way. And it's everyone's just kind of like figuring this out. And it was, we finally were like, guys, campaign side, narrative is, is the focus. Like this is a master chief story. So everything has to serve the narrative. Which is like cool. I feel like I was like that makes complete sense, right? Like <laughs> Halo is a narrative property, in at least campaign side. Like it's a very we have very well, strong campaign lore is, building, right? Yeah. yeah, very strong lore. You even have there's TV shows. Yes, there's TV shows. There's books. There's plenty of things Ooh. in the Halo universe. Right? Right. Halo is a very robust universe. And so finally, when we made that call, it was able to be like, okay, now we have to pick key in here. How does this decision serve the story? How does this cinematic tie into this gameplay beat? Right, um, right. And so that made things a little bit easier. Um, the relatively farther into production, once we kind of had that nighting happen, but all that to say, you know, that's that is the important thing. Being able to, when you have these giant franchises, giant IP, giant studios, you still need to have that very clear direction and distribution of being like, okay, this is what we're following here. Here's how everybody keys into that. But there's no if you have a 300, 200 person team. And we had like 700. You can't not have that. 400? How many was it? 400. I wow. think it depended how you sliced it. But I mean, I mean if you like brought publishing it, and stuff in it. If you don't like, start with that, you're dead. Yeah. And then trying to pivot later is always a challenge. But if you have a clear vision, you know, we used to always say plans are worthless, but planning is priceless. Mm-hmm. Because if you know how you got to your plan, when you encounter the enemy and it goes to crap, yeah. you're like, okay, redo that same plan, but with these new variables. And you're just constantly doing that. And then you're able to guide a very, very large ship. But if you start without those things, mm-hmm. I mean, as soon as the ship's going 500 miles an hour, it's just going to go off the tracks. And this is, again, it ties into what we just talked about, where it's like, if you don't have that robust, from a narrative side, if you don't have a robust, robust world building, if you don't have a lore, if you don't have an understanding of what the key narrative beats of the story are, people are just going to go do things. Yep. And then it's just going to be a web of whatever. You know what would be interesting is like, <clears throat> and we're talking about the, the ethereal nature of our job versus the concrete nature of engineering. Like, what do you think is the test of, I hand you a world building doc, because it's not length, but like, what are the tests that say this world building doc is ready to support the weight of a 300 person team and a big franchise? Like, how would we audit, how would we audit our own work to be like, this is ready to load bear Mm -hmm. and it's not page count? No, definitely not. I would say it is the whole point of that is to have the team have a clear and digestible vision of what we're trying to achieve. So again, like let's take Halo for an example. Halo has a giant backstory. Are we talking about the Forerunners? Are we talking about the UNSC? Are we talking about whatever, like all these different chunks in time and what has happened? But we, you know, it's easy to rally around. This is a Master Chief story that is taking place in this time. It is about a story where Master Chief does blah. And then does the world building serve that exact moment in Mm -hmm. time? Um, And is it clear and digestible for the team? So I would say if it serves whatever the narrative goals are and the product goals of the game, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then as long as the world building (laughs) ties in enough to that and the lore ties in enough to that moment to serve that story. And again, it can't be like, you know, if I was like, hey, here's the entire lore of Halo and it's this big and you're reading through the first 400 pages of the Forerunners, but that has nothing to do with what we're, what what we're doing. talking about. But yeah. if it, that's the key is, does it? Yeah. If there's a piece in there that does. Well, I'm interested in like what you would think is on the on the IP that I was working on for three years, the fantasy IP yeah. that got canceled. Like that was kind of my guiding light was like, we didn't want to, what I would call it would be conjecture Yeah. for conjecture's sake. So like... This planet has six moons, and when they get in this state, it's super mega king tide. And this thing is like, yeah. you know, like, and you're just listening for a little while, and you're like, maybe, maybe. And then when the when that's done, you're like, okay, does that? What does that mean? Contribute to the why now of the frame? Yeah. Like, is that part? Is that important to the con to the motivations of the conflicts that are happening? Exactly. So what you wanted to shake out a world building document to be like, just like you were saying, that's what we were doing. Was like, well, I need to know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this character's motivation because she's the main pair of the antagonist. Yeah. Why did she do this? How did she go about doing it? And then what environment is she in that lets her have those options? Mm-hmm. What caused her to have those options? And then you just do you dig backwards a bit. Now apparently I can't. I don't know where to stop. Like I dig backwards <laughs> on a character's motivation, and I realize that like, there's a point at which you're like, 
they just feel that way. Yeah, <laughs> it's just who they are. <laughs> they just that's what they think. And a lot of it's like you know, uh, evil wizard. Why it is going to be evil? Yeah. And you're like, he was mad at something, and you can keep going. Why? Well, was it because he was dropped when he was little? Like, how far back do you go? Yeah, it's almost infinite. You go back, but I think at some point you cut it off and you make postulate statements. Yeah, but I think detecting if you have enough motivation and understanding to produce the next beat and yeah. it's what happens is the acts start writing themselves you're like oh well, she did all this and that and then that and this was the inciting incident and you get to the next beat you're like well clearly she's gonna blow up because yeah. you just did this thing and you're thwarting her goals because they're posed to yours as the protagonist um, I think that is the stuff that I want to, if you're not writing a book mm-hmm. how to codify the ethereal nature of are you ready for yeah. production and games and you would do it you know just have a sheet that goes through and audits that stuff yeah just to make sure. Yeah, so I think it's 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 certainly a challenge because you need to be proactive enough in your world building that the writers have something to key off of and write from. But you also, like you said, need to be reactive enough because maybe you're like, oh, actually in this beat we realize that we need to know where this character is from and why their culture is that way. It's like, oh, whatever. You need. <laughs> right. But Put that's where the together. trick is knowing how to world build and not just adding wrinkles and complexity because that's always the easiest go-to is to go... Yeah, as opposed like, to like take the column and add the column. Yeah, and that takes twice as much work. They're from this solar system, which has six planets, and the fourth planet in that solar system is too close to their sun. Yeah. It's too hot. Yes. Like, okay. <laughs> well, that's what that's that happens all the time when we're doing building. People are like, oh, uh, there's a new property of the thing, and it does. You know, when it's yellow, it does this thing, and it yeah. like it just does immediate fix. And I think that breaks. It's less quality for what you're trying to do, and I think the high quality world building is what really sings. You know, you look at Tears of the Kingdom, for example, and it's mm-hmm. pretty solidly put together, right? Yeah. And it's very simplistic. Like, they don't have to go super deep with that. It's just, there was a Kingdom High rule, it fell to Ganon, that's it. You know, it's just... But look at how simple, <laughs> you were just able to synthesize that. And what happens is you're in the world design rooms, and everyone wants to complicate the high concepts. And yeah. those are, they seem bereft of value at that level and often it's just the villain is it this thing yeah. and as you get into the motivation it starts to get more and more detailed but if you can't explain the motivation chain just the way you did like it doesn't work and I think Tears of the Kingdom is a good example of excellent world building where this whole giant 100 hour plus game yeah. unfolds based on this very simple yeah. premise right even yeah. the Tears of the Kingdom themselves that little story yeah. that that is is like super charming and it scratches stiff like you pick up the pawns and you forget what happened yeah and, yeah. It's just great. What do you think is the challenge and difference between writing something like Dead Space, where, again, that's much more linear, where it's like, oh, Isaac starts here, he ends here. You know, it's literally a corridor shooter, so you're, like, going... It's very much, like, on rails. People even call it Halo the same thing, like a corridor rail shooter. It's just, like, yeah. you just go through the game, and then you end. Versus, like, something breath like Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom, Elden Ring, where it's just you throw the player into this giant sandbox, and you say, go. Right. And then the players are will discover the story at their leisure and at their own interest. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess what do you what do you think is the differences and main challenges between those two? Well, the question is always figuring out how to get people to your narrative tent poles. How do I get to an introduction? How do I get people to the establishing shot, intro, inciting incident, cross into act two? Yeah. Like how do those things happen when the protagonist has grabbed the camera and runs away? In a linear quarter shooter, you have much more control. It's not quite film, but it's close. You end up with sort of Half Life Two problems, where Half Life Two solved for everybody, like. I need to draw your attention over here. I need you to go here. So they would just light the set. So that was the only thing interesting to look at. So you would be sort of subliminally pulled through what was point of interest that happened to also um, concentrically map to a narrative beat. I need you to come here so that the inciting incident could kick off. Yeah. You, you also can't go anywhere else. You know what I mean? <laughs> they had perfected a lot of the interactive versions of narrative structure. So the linear is more easy because you just eventually have control. Like it's you're going from A to B. Mm-hmm. And I got to kill um, so many creatures to get there. So you can sort of nest your narrative needs inside those deterministic events in a linear shooter. And if you need to put a volume trigger in and grab the camera <laughs> and say like, hello, this is now the beginning of act two. Yeah. And you're like, okay. And, you know, or shake the camera, knock Isaac down and he stands up and act two is happening. Yeah. That's easier to do. Um, you know, you're mostly interstitialing stuff. Action just becomes the action scenes of a script. Yeah. And the rest of it becomes all the stuff in between. So that's like slicing it up. In these other games, it's much more the same thing has to be achieved. But think of Tears of the Kingdom. How do you get somebody to the inciting incident? You have this giant 360 open space. Um, the only way you pass through that is to either encounter a 
the gate. I forget how you get off of that first island, and it's either an, an ability that you unlock, right? Or I think something. You get you just dive off the island at some point, right? I forget why. Like, because if you you fall off the island at first, you just die. But then there's a moment where it's like you can dive off the island now, and then there's a big that's, cinematic. So yeah. that's the gate. So the mechanic, <coughs> the mechanic that is also tied to the inciting incident, mm-hmm. right? And so getting to that mechanic then gets nested with world building, and you're like, okay, do 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 do. The way that you would unlock that mechanic is you've learned something about the state of the world and your goals in it, and how you're the protagonist of this story, and what am I trying to do? Which, frankly, they set up immediately in Tears of the Kingdom. You started with again in cinematic, yeah, right, and then you're shot into this world, and it's like. <laughs> okay go go and as you explore you start to figure out more of what's happening and really that's those worlds are it's like an amusement park so you basically are tasked with seducing people's attention mm-hmm. while they have many things going on that they come and they walk up to the th- the one place where you have constrained their other abilities they can't secretly get out of this act two bubble physically yeah. until they've done conditional sets are all flipped bits until they get to a point where like okay now i can move out of here yeah. and in getting that ability i have then crossed through narrative beats yeah. that provide what would be a narrative linear story so you can lock those into those unlocks if that makes sense yeah. And then in doing that, you're like, okay, I'm ready to fall off the island. I have done everything and seen everything I need to comprehend an inciting incident. And mm-hmm. then off I go. Yeah. And I know that they Ooh. very meticulous, meticulous, meticulously, meticulously designed the world of Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom so that that's why there's so many mountains and stuff and so many hills is they wanted at all times you to have at least three things in the distance that would be like ooh little things they can go explore which is why that game is so addicting and fun is because you go to a POI you pick up the thing and then you look over and there's three things you can see oh I'm going to go over there and that's why it's like I'm going to go there and then I'm done for the day and three hours go by and you're like yeah, did I, you ever you do time. that? <laughs> yeah. I consistently was like I'm going okay I'm just going to go over there Yeah. right now I'm, prom- I'm not anything else and I did it like 17 17- <laughs> thousand times and never did it yeah like, dude, dude, oh wait there's a korok oh wait there's a thing i mean that's an impressive achievement to make a map that yeah. dense but that's an epitome of that style of the open world that's just perfect yeah so you're goal driven and eventually you get there mm-hmm. but you do the game in the meantime it's like a good version of the witcher you know how witcher was like the main story was not really the main story mm-hmm. you were going off witchering yeah and you come back into the main story yeah and until you figured that out you were miserable in the game i was and i'm like <laughs> I'm going to this masked elf that keeps kicking my ass. Yeah, what? I'm oh. not a fan of the series at all as I reach over to my witch's side. <laughs> You're two swords. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that's kind of more, um, I don't know if I want to say classic, but that seems to be like mostly open world like Skyrim does mm-hmm. it where it's like you have the main story thread and you can just speed run it and just try and beat can the game. You? You can. Aren't they level gated? Like you, you do you encounter something at story beat five and you're like, I'm doing a power. Okay, you can, or you can but you can just power through it, you know what I mean? You can just really? get good. <laughs> do it. But don't you have to level up to do that? Not really. Really? You can just try really. I just don't have skills. <laughs> but then there's also like it's like the main thread and then you just have like little branching side stories, which mm-hmm. is like these are all the witchering stories where Geralt just goes and does stuff. Well, those are, to me, the Witcher is level-gated. Like, you, I couldn't progress in the main story until I had Witchered enough to be able to tackle that node. Mm-hmm. Versus, like, Mass Effect, you're hard-gated. Like, you have to gather all your people before you go to the Red um, Reaper. You don't have to. What? That was, that was one of the first games that I played where it's like, it's like, you can go beat the game right now, and you go and you just get demolished, and you die, and the game's over. But I think oh, I think you can get, get a you have to get a handful of people first, but you don't need to get everybody. Wow! And it's, but it's just like the more side quests you do and the more people you get increases your chances and upgrading your ship and all that. But that was one of the first games where I was just like I would see that the the Omega Relay, and I would be like I could go right now and beat the game, but I'm not ready. You know, there's like all and they made it red and like evil, so it's always this impending doom. Yeah, I like great. that structure. I I used to think it was too simple. Now I think it's just right. Because I because Baldur's Gate, I played the Baldur's Gate. I'm like that is not right. Like, that's too much. Like what would you? Is Baldur's Gate? I guess it's open world technically. Yeah, it's it's much more D and D than it is like. It's it's supposed to be very much choose your own adventure. There's obviously the main story and characters, yeah. and you know, there's it's not like it's just completely open. But Baldur's Gate is is there's been no other games that I know like it where it's, the amount of player choice is. Pretty I guess it's characterized by player choice. Yeah. Because it's not Tears of the Kingdom. Like, you walk around... Now, you have to walk around Baldur's Gate to discover everything. Yeah. But it's not as mechanics-laden as Tears of the Kingdom, so I'm not doing all these fun mini-games constantly. Yeah. I get loot and I fight, and I get loot and I fight. Yeah. 
but you eventually wander, discover a map, and then you finally, when it's time to leave, you're like, it tells you, hey, <laughs> you're leaving. Act two is about to happen, and you're going to leave Act one. Are you good? You're yeah. Like, no. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know. No. You tell me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I think the only the the game that doesn't work for me, like I said, for multiple reasons, but I'm it's an unpopular opinion. I'm not a huge fan of Dark Souls or Elden Ring because they don't do what Tears of the Kingdom does. I know, shocking. We turn the fucking thing off now. They don't do what Tears of the Kingdom does, which, which is they just throw you into the world and say you're an you're a dude in a world, and then you could play the entire game without knowing what's happening. It is up to you to discover who you are, why you're here, what all of the gods are, like what the conflict was. And a lot of folks like that, like kind of mystery box s- storytelling that I think works in Tears of the Kingdom. But Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild both start of like, hey, it was High Rule. This guy Ganon showed up. He messed things up. You're the hero of time. Go save the world. Whereas Dark Souls, Elden Ring, you just show up and they're just like, you're in, you're you're just a guy. I don't know. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Die several times. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And so that's why it never worked for me. Like I never, oh, I never knew who I was or why I was there, and it, it wasn't compelling to me. Well, my writing team on some of the game, the games I'm working on now, my lead writer loves um, Elden Ring because of the way he loves the way the world building unfolds. Yeah. He just loves that. And again, I think it's that there's. The world building is so well done that there's a reward for real discovering stuff because it connects to other stuff and starts to make a story. Yeah. Which I think is again the case for spectacle versus substance, right? So yeah. I don't know. I, I to be honest, I didn't play Elden Ring. I was going to and I was like I didn't have the right equipment at the time. Yeah. I also am old, so I don't <laughs> have skills anymore. So <laughs> those games are frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. What um I'm curious after <clears throat> Dead Space. What did you? What was the? What did you move on to after Dead Space? Because it was Hardline after Dead Space. It was a little collection of stuff. No, they decided they didn't need me for Hardline because mm-hmm. it wasn't Dead Space, and so who was doing narrative on Hardline? Or was there even much of a story team? Yeah, there was. Um, I think they used a, a dear friend of mine, Tom Bissell. Mm-hmm. I think wrote Hardline. I'd have to go back and look. He has been. He wrote all the. Gears stuff. Mm-hmm. He wrote the book about the room called the um, Catastrophe Artist, oh, yeah, Disaster yeah. Artist. Yeah, yeah. He's a great writer. I love Tom Bissell to death. So he did, I think, that for yeah. them. I think. Oh my God, what if I'm wrong? Tom, I love you. I'm sorry if I discredited <laughs> you for that. Uh, but somebody was writing that and they had other stuff going. So I didn't participate in Hardline. Um, I went off and did other stuff. Gosh, I, I got. Um, on with Sledgehammer a little bit and did Call of Duty Infinite Warfare the one with Kevin Spacey yeah I just kind of managed the cinematics a bit you see you weren't doing narrative like you were just doing production strictly not creative right right and then I got on down at (laughs) at call at uh, Dice LA which is when I first moved to LA before you and I met Um, so I did that for a little bit and then instead they did Battlefield 1 Mm -hmm. which was being directed perfectly by Stefan Strandberg, Stefan Strandberg, who I love to death. He's this fiery, redheaded Swede. He's the he's like the perfect guy you want doing that. He's like this really richly creative, yeah. um, effervescent guy. He's so good at his job. And he had a vision for Battlefield 1, and he was selling it to uh, Patrick Soderlund at the time in charge of it. And he did what you're supposed to do when you do an IP like that. He's like, look, this is my vision of it. And as a European, mm-hmm. they have a very different take on World War One than we do. And he's like, look, it's not grainy, dirty, muddy, trenches right yeah. it was a time of change they had gone from like horse and buggy and to mechan- mechanized tanks it was the industrial revolution in that war and it was bright there were you know beautiful like people were wearing big sky- it was it was not dirty yeah um, all that he goes there's a very vibrant part of that that he wants to tell these very sad stories and because you and i were talking about how his narrative suffers so greatly under production realities Dice was particularly difficult about mm-hmm. this. They would plan these 12 level events. And my friend Tobias, um, Tobias Dahl, who I also love to death, he's friends with Stefan, um, was the senior producer on those and the single player. And he was tasked with this impossible task to take what was a 12 beat story, Brian, that was like maybe six or seven is all that got out. They just wow. cut the scope and you're like, they cut it in half basically. Like, how do you make that make sense? And I think they had to produce stuff that just didn't make sense, but he did it. That, mm. that Tobias is great. So Stefan, having known that, said, how about we do an anthology series? And I was in the wrong at the time. I was like, there's no way. That's terrible. Nobody's going to want to watch <laughs> anthology. That's garbage. And you know, you get really opinionated about yeah. stuff. I was like, no, no, this is terrible. And I'm grumbling and grumbling. And like, no, no, it'll be fine. So they picked a bunch of individual stories. 
And Zach Bedka, who I uh, had hired from uh, previous working, previously working with him on a Call of Duty Infinite Warfare mm-hmm. as a writer, he wrote those, and he wrote the one which was Vante Savoia, which was a, the one about two Italian brothers mm-hmm. going to war and having a very personal story, and then uh, helped us write the one, and he did write the one about the Australian, God, I'm so bad, I'm sorry, Australia. <laughs> he, they have a very important moment in World War One that they are, that they celebrate, they had, a, and I can't remember the name of the event, but we wrote those two. And so we had all those uh, going out, and that was a very big success. It turned yeah. out the anthology was the way to go, <laughs> and those visual stories were great, and Battlefield One was a huge success, so that was, that was narrative directing again. That was great on that. Another example <laughs> of production coming to get you. Zach had written two brothers. Yeah. And at the time, Dice LA was like, hey, we get how many of these, you know, how many heads do we have? <clears throat> heads are like $250,000, $300,000 assets. That, yeah, just to scan somebody's head and get the hyper Just to get it rigged asset. and stuff is very, very expensive. And we're like, okay, so we have two brothers. These are our main list of characters. They had all this anthology going on. And they're like, oh, you'll probably have to do two, three, four heads or something like that. We're like, okay, so we'll need two. Maybe this will be a third one and a fourth one. We came back and they said, you have one at later as they got going. And we were like, meep, 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 meep. <laughs> and I was like, Zach, the brothers are twins now. And he's like, <laughs> what? Because it's like, you know, that's how that works. If I'd known these were twins from the beginning, I would have done something completely different. I wouldn't have, you can't just make brothers twins like twins, but the whole story is twins. And I'm like, I love you and I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm deeply sorry. And he's just like, oh my God, I hate games. And I was like, sorry, reality. So we made it work and we did the, the stuff. He did a great job. Uh, I think that got some BAFTA nods even on these stories. So yeah, yeah it was, that was that. So that happened, that Short, long story short, that was the Battlefield experience. And then I came and met my friend Brian Beebe up to work on and was so excited to come work with Amy Hennig, of course. She's famous, famous, famous. Yeah. Uh, great writer, very talented, and I was excited to come work with her on a Star War. Yeah. Star War. Yeah. Who doesn't want to work on Star Wars? That was cool. Yeah, it was great. And then that, like you said, that lasted for a while and then I went to Riot. Because I don't think you and I have talked very much about your Battlefield 1 experience. So you were doing narrative direction there. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Were you directing specific anthologies or were you directing the entire... No, they had just assigned a different anthology stories to us to write. And I so see. I just was in charge of those two. I see. So you had those two that you were in charge of. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Did we do three? We might have done three. Advice, chat, don't get old. Um, <laughs> I think it was those two. It might have been three, but I'm old, so I forget. But yeah. yeah. So then Star Wars and then Riot. And then, then you were doing some... Just film or TV Yeah, stuff. I went and worked back with Tobias, as a matter of fact. He had opened up, uh, they were working at Goodbye Kansas, which was the CGI studio out of uh, Sweden. Yeah. Um, so I did that for like a year. They were trying to publish this, um, they hooked up with a guy named, oh, I forget, I want to butcher his name, Bjorn. Anyway, they were doing a, there's a famous troll story in Swedish folklore mm-hmm. that they were trying to turn into a movie. And we were doing a little short picture of that with, um, oh gosh, I'm so bad with names. <laughs> <laughs> who was the girl who played an ex machina? I don't know. Alicia. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Famous girl. She knew Bjorn, the director, and was happy to be the princess in that. And they, it was a it's really they did excellent, excellent CG work. I thought I was kind of done with games at that point. I thought I'm just going to do this. I'm just a little burned out on all this after decades of it. Um, So then from there, I was looking for work again, and I landed at Scopely to work as the narrative director or on, you know, a new um, fantasy IP. Who doesn't want to go write fantasy IP stuff? Yeah. And had a good time there for three years. Nice. Four years now. Yeah. It's a shame that we couldn't talk more about the fantasy IP because I know you put a ton of... It was so good. I put all my best practices into practice on that. We had excellent world building. I was so proud of the work my writers had done on the backstory was was robust it was gonna was gonna run a franchise Mm -hmm. it was meant to be a transmedia franchise we had great like story arcs we had five books we had written all these different things and it was just gonna really be a great epic fantasy tale i was really proud of because what you try to do in video games and the franchises is have a perpetual problem Mm -hmm. that always needs attention but is never solved so you never want to throw the ring in mordor yeah Right, because then your story's <laughs> over. <laughs> and back then, there wasn't such thing as like MCU franchises. You always need to have something happening. And yeah. your choices are a big bad, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or Thanos with some stones and a stone per movie, and yeah. whatever you're contriving. What do you find is the difference between doing something with this grand, 
epic world building like you know this new fantasy ip right like you said where it's you i you know you mentioned me wrote like four or five books of this like gigantic kind of franchise versus something like um battlefield or call of duty where it's just again almost with battlefield especially it's just like an anthology of just like this is just this small moment in time how does your mindset as like a narrative director change and how do you navigate directing something like that between those two giant different products yeah you have a big scalar change like your brain goes on the big ones you're like i don't have gravity to work with i have to invent gravity i have to invent the sun i have to invent everything Mm -hmm. so right all with an eye towards the why now of the frame like why i gotta produce a backstory that produces a main story Mm -hmm. like motivation characters conflicts things that are like once upon a time. Yeah. And then you go. Uh, when you inherit something like a Battlefield or a Call of Duty or even a Star War, all that work is done and you're just responsible for producing an episode on that world. Mm-hmm. Right? So now you have to ingest the world and be like, okay, what's this? So like those anthologies, and to be fair, the people at DICE, had, like Stefan had already picked these anthologies and we got to sign those. So we didn't even have to worry about that creative lift. We just had to execute well on the scripts. Mm-hmm. But like if you were doing a Dead Space or something, like that stuff, all that work is done. Now you just have to mount forward storytelling and just break a new story. Mm-hmm. Not that that's small work, but I'm just saying, you know, world building is a precursor to main story. And so mm-hmm. it's either this much work or this much work. Yeah. And it's a lot either way. But both require just a different mindset and different execution needs, I guess. It seems like it, like it feels like it's almost like to get to the why now, when I say that, what I mean is the opening frame of your movie, the reason the lens is here is because the conflicts of the world have produced an interesting moment for your protagonist and antagonist to show up. Um, in all cases, you have to figure out that. Yeah. And so either you have to build the house to get there or travel through it and study the blueprints and figure out what that is. And then you've got to make the most interesting story going forward. So it's always the same mounted amount of data in your head right mm-hmm. now some of it you have to do some of it you just have to read but it's always the same process like you don't ever get to escape that holistic view of it mm-hmm. in my opinion because otherwise I don't know what you're doing <laughs> what is is there one that you prefer like do you prefer doing the kind of expansive this is an entire new world I have to figure out like you said how gravity works in this world like all, all the way down to those kind of nitty gritty details that are obviously needed for the story versus like hey this is a world war one story so we kind of know you are you already have a lot of stuff set up off the bat you don't have to be like what planet are we on um new world this. please <laughs> you like new world i mean if you look at even like back on everything or nothing and you had we didn't have to adhere yeah. to a previous property you can problem solve sky's the limit so imagination comes into play people who obey the column of cause and effect and can work within that you get brilliant uh, solutions everyone is so fired up because they're doing what they came to do Mm -hmm. you came to be a writer this is time to write and it's everyone's just really enlivened with that exercise and the the solutions are great you're making brand new stuff you're not retreading old ground you're not really constrained sometimes you know uh, art through adversity works but this is better if you don't just bleed out with too many options you know how to make something I prefer that because then it can be I personally prefer fresh and brave yeah. to like safe and timid mm-hmm. and safe and timid is the purview of giant corporations like that's yeah. all that they can afford to do disco Elysium's entire over is fresh and brave there's not a single thing about that game that isn't at the rafters yeah right and that's not something that big companies really can do like they need another billion dollar hit it's got to be four quadrant yeah so immediately you're gonna get you know i'm gonna get a pastel <laughs> fantasy land with elves and doors oh, God. right it's just going to be it can't be anything else like yeah. they don't dare try something new because then that'll just when you say four quadrant what is four quadrant that's an old movie term where you had old young male and female mm-hmm. so it's something that hits all all those yeah it appeals to all the different generations and genders I you think that's right I might get corrected in the notes but I thought it was gender and age but the four quarters. something, but it's basically saying broad appeal. This has to, yeah, family appeal. That's a very, very broad appeal. So you can't do something niche like what's niche. Um, uh, the Crow movie is very niche. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, Fight Club. Yeah, niche. Right. That's those are not four quadrant. Uh, four quadrant is Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Right. That kind of stuff. Interesting. I don't. I don't know though because I think this is something that's you know fascinated me. So working on Valorant, working on premium content weapon skins like I do now there's been a huge learning into product like what is like when I joined games and when I was working in games I never really thought of them as product 
I think in my mind because that was like it just sounds like businessman. You imagine some guy like what's the product we're selling? Like I never really liked that. <laughs> But now that I'm like knee deep in it all day, every day, I have like a different appreciation for it because it's, it's, it's super important, even from a creative standpoint to be like, what are we making? Why are we making it? Who is this for? Um, and I never really considered that, like, especially when you're working on something like a Star Wars or Halo. It's all that's done for you. Yeah. It's it already appealed like, to somebody. Yeah. And it's just kind of like, oh, I'm Turn the target, the o- I'm the target audience for this. So oh, I just, okay. I kind of get it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't hmm. really have to think about it that much. Hmm. But, you know, when you're making different weapon skins for all these different folks, you really have to put your mindset into and really define, like, who is this for and why are we making it? And I think it's we're in an interesting time because with Helldivers, I don't know if you've kept up with Helldivers too. I've been, well, I haven't played it yet, but it, I love how popular that is. I love that it tickles to me to death. But I think the CEO has kind of obviously exploded in popularity um, on Twitter and things like that just for how community-oriented this game is. Um, and he has in his bio, a game for everybody is a game for no one. Um, and I think that's the the interesting thing. And I think that's honestly what we do a lot at, at Riot, which is very specifically, we're going to make the best game we possibly can. We're going to make the best MOBA we possibly, possibly can with Fleet of Legends. We're going to make the best tax shooter that we can with Valorant. We're going to make the best auto chess game that we can with TFT. Yep. And saying, we're going to hit this target audience as specifically and as robustly as we can so i think riot is an interesting microcosm of this kind of product positioning when you with target audience being like we're going to target these this very specific niche mm-hmm. and hopefully they the and they love it so much yeah they knock it out of the park with these people that they tell they, they're like you got to play this game like please play this with me and i think hell divers is another great example mm-hmm, of that mm-hmm. it's a space Star Troopers, you're like a fascist government. It's like kind of ridiculous and it's super fun and crazy. Yep, and it's yep. like, who would have thought that this massive audience would have loved this this but game? Focus but. and appeal is the point. Mm-hmm. I mean, Valorant knew what it was doing when it came out. Remember, I remember reading that you know more than I do, but they were like obsessed with the tick rates of the servers because yes. they knew it was going to be competitive. Like that, talk about knowing your audience. Yeah, exactly. That's good. And you're also discussing the difference between commercial and fine art. If you don't want to worry about an audience. Go find a big warehouse and paint interesting <laughs> shapes. You know, just do yeah. your art because mm-hmm. you're doing it to express and be in that elite territory. But if you're trying to make money, there's nothing else but finding an audience you resonate with. And right. the more focused there you do, and now that you're in product, like a lot of stuff at EA was run by, as you know, marketing had a big say because of that. Well, yeah, yeah. is this going to appeal to anybody? <laughs> yeah. We're not here making free art. It has to make money. Yeah. So now you know the ins and outs of it. And I don't hate stuff that's driven by... The, the initial requirements of this appeal to this market this yeah. market I like art that starts with restrictions start with that and then be yeah. imaginative I don't and like that's, it. that's the whole that's the whole point of like hey that's where real creativity comes from, comes from give me right. some pretty strict constraints and then I'll weasel our way out of it and do what I right? can with it like that's, that's the MacGyver is such a popular thing he's yeah, like look he can you can never hold that's what's fun and I know that we talked a lot about that in our dead space talk too of like this this is a small audience, a niche audience, but you hit that audience so well that now Dead Space is obviously in the the uh, what do you call it? the zeitgeist, where it's just like, hey, people who like narrative single player horror, sci fi, like this is a very niche audience, but people fucking love Dead Space. <laughs> <laughs> like I think it's such a it. good, it's such an interesting case because that is a very laser focused game. Yeah. Like that's the only game I've ever been on where the beginning vision was what we shipped. And Glenn had a laser focus. He goes, I want to make the scariest game ever. Mm-hmm. He loves horror. I mean, he knew what he was making. And that's what we made. And we executed well. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't... I think there is a perspective on it to say some stuff is is constrained by its niche. Like horror... We talked about this in some of our stuff just can't grow beyond horror fans like mm-hmm. not people that don't want horror don't want horror yeah and we grew that garden in the wrong spot as much as we all loved horror that success was was over there like oh man that should have been more on a four quadrant thing like maybe an action rpg or something yeah right that had more broad appeal and would mm-hmm. have that execution bar imagine if we'd hit at out of the park on something that was different that had more broad appeal yeah, which is Tears, think of Tears of the Kingdom. I think it's big, big games that are not. That's four quadrant is. Uh, yeah, 
interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's that true. No matter how well done Dead Space was, it's always capped by that genre's cap. Yeah. And that same would be true of like a Western or, I don't know, think about the thing like rom-coms. You know, genres are slicing an audience into specific pieces. Mm-hmm. By definition, that means you don't have access to the other ones. And that's why Four Corners are popular because it's everybody, but that's very saturated too. So when you're working on weapons for Valorant, you know, what is the... Do you seg- you have audience segmentation that I'm sure you're addressing as you go across yeah. the wheel? Right? Yeah, exactly. It's like we want to find things that we know that our audience likes, but we also want to try and branch out and make more niche stuff too. So it's just like, you know, we're not going to we want stuff to be you know kind of more broad appeal, but we know what that means for for us on Valorant, like what weapon skins we think players will like and what weapon skins we're going to put a lot of work into. Mm-hmm. But sometimes it's like, oh, like one of the weapon skins that I that I worked on and produced that we just released is like, oh, here's a weapon skin that's basically just like a tank. It's like a tank in your hands. And so that was kind of the initial pitch brief. And it's like, okay, cool. There's a lot of like a, people who like more grounded military themes will like this weapon. Perfect. It's not for everybody. Like, you don't have to like this. If but you don't like the gun, that's fine. Be, right. Yeah. And so it's like, that's okay. Um, but when we're making something that's kind of one of our larger bets that has all the bells and whistles on it, those are things where it's like, okay, we're pretty sure that we think a lot of folks are going to like this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but it's still not just like, it's a cool gun. It's like we have a very specific <clears throat> target audience that we think, okay, these are the kind of people who we think will really like this weapon. Um, but if we, you're in a thing like that where you have a box of chocolates offering like Valorant, you have a lot of choices. I think that's the only way to do it is to have extreme servicing of the niches and you've mm-hmm. got this wonderful bouquet you can offer. Yeah. And then in that way, it does appeal to everyone. Yeah. Despite having all these shards. Yeah, exactly. Because there's one, there's something for everyone in there well done. Yes. As opposed to one thing you sand it into a meaningless jelly bean, you're like, I hope everybody likes yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Because if we just look, oh, this is a gun that every single person has to like. It's like, you're, what do you have? You have nothing. And you just, got you got a nothing burger. It's, yeah. so it's for nothing, right? For yeah. everybody. Because I think you've probably worked with more writers than I have who come from different backgrounds. Like I've worked with some folks who come from comics or like um, more novel side versus film and TV side versus game side. Like those are, all of these require different skill sets and all of these, and of course, depending on the game too or what you need, you know, I think a lot of narrative designers or writers will come into games being like, I'm going to write The Last of Us and they end up people going, Grenade. Grenade out. Get down. Take cover. Oh, you've been there. You know, that is no, that is the, the hardest, harshest truth ever. Yeah. Well, anybody in narrative is welcome to help contribute. But the problem comes when you're like, like a playwright or a novelist or a comic person and a screenwriter and a game writer who are the same as amusement park writers. The forms are so different. I think that furthest from the art craft is novelists because it's one person who's doing all the work of the 60, 20, 400 people on your team, the lighting, VFX artist, modeler, character, animator, motion capture shooter, game yeah. designer, creative director, creative director, <laughs> mechanics director. Like those people are hanging, waiting for that one person to finish writing that script. And heaven forbid it doesn't obey the needs of the game. Like, yeah. well, you can't do that. Your script can't do that. Your script can't do that. Like, and it's like... And the novel has theater of the mind, mm-hmm. and you have internal monologues, which is the, again that's a barrier that you cross into screenplays. You don't have that. Mm-hmm. Well, certainly is true of games as well. And on top of that, novelists are just lugubrious and and voluminous and and, and that, just words, words, words. You spend all this time. I like, think of Dune. Yeah. Like that whole first section of that when you're just getting off that damn water planet. <laughs> like that's not a screenplay. That's a novel. Yeah. I'm happy to sit and float in world building. They just soak and soak and soak in time, and they just have. Very much looser structure if they want so they are particularly poorly um prepared to enter the game world they would yeah. it's better than much closer planet is the screenplay people yeah because they get in there and they get beat up all the time by harsh notes by people who are you know not maybe the most creatively trained <laughs> you know and it's yeah. a really ugly awful world that they exist in all the time tv writers same thing short hot scripts got to get to the point so they're closer mm-hmm. um comic writers comic book writers are also closer because you get little tiny bubbles yeah. gotta get to the point it's static graphic images they've got to get there so those people have a much easier transition um and then the last all unless you've written for games all the writers have to transition over to interactivity which is the protagonist grabs a camera and runs away. Yeah. And you're like, how do you seduce back 
all the stuff that was hard deterministic tools you had before, like I'm going to do this camera and do close up here. I'm going to do this and get this motion. I'm going to do this for the white shot. You're like, mm, you know, yeah, <laughs> I, you <laughs> got none of that. The, camera, the player is making all this happen, you know. Yeah. So that's the big one, and, and losing all that control is a little bit of a moment for them where they kind of breathe in, and then they, once they figure out all the new fun stuff they can do, mm. um, they get they get reengaged again. But that's how, been my experience. How have you helped them? navigate that like what is it is there like a technique that you have or is it just kind of like being like hey you don't have to this is not how this works or like you don't have to write this much like well, how have you navigated that in the past yeah a lot of it is just explaining the train you like a rosetta stone just explaining why not yeah. if they were written a scene that has something that just can't happen or like getting into the scene you're like well actually think about what happened before the scene this was the gameplay i had a volume trigger and then the scene happens mm -hmm. so what i don't need the scene to have is an intro and a setup yeah right it's it's already done it's picking up action that's been in the right before you in the previous frame you're a match frame to that mm -hmm. and you go forward and the lights come on they're like oh Right, yeah. and you know your your get in get outs are very different. You know, it's still a scene needs a motivator, needs a driver, right? But you're part of a big flow. Like the whole game is collapsed into a narrative flow, mm -hmm. and you're just writing pieces of it as the player drives through. That helps them, you know, realize they don't have to carry the whole screenplay on these vignettes that they're like interspersed across it. Um, it seems, yeah. it seems like the, one of the big differences, not only in the fact, that, like you're saying, like the amount of words and dialogue or whatever else the setup is needed is typically, that's not what's needed for game writing most of the time. It's also the fact that how collaborative, especially if you work on a AAA game, I guess at a smaller game too, but how collaborative it is where it's like, no, oh, you right. have to understand what is the level designer doing? What is, you know the artist doing here? Where does this scene actually kick off? Who is this person talking to? We have to make this dialogue snappy because they just have to get to the point where they say, here's your golden chicken. Go bring it over there. Yeah. Um, Literally. Pull the red lever. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> seven words. You have nine. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> it's terrible. They, If they haven't already experienced screenplay writing and comic book writing, that's the first lesson. Is yeah. So the prosy people mm -hmm. really struggle because, well, unless you're making like Final Fantasy 14 or something where people want a thousand page fantasy novel to show up in little windows that you just sit and read yeah like some games want that but most of the games you're referring to the modern action ones are very much more like hollywood action scripts yeah so you have a paucity of words like it's almost nothing yeah right frankly it's really quite hard to write <laughs> and you're like bah, 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 bah. yeah the exactly script, right and you they they enjoy the new tools you know you get maybe get a cinematic but you have walk and talks you've got stuff happening and the rest of the game's going on in the menu people might chat with you so there's lots of ways to get the story across they enjoy but it's always the it's always having to trim down the pros because you, you can't yeah it's got to be faster simpler just nobody ever gets to make a speech maybe at, at places you would expect a speech in an action movie like at the big yeah. monologues and yeah. stuff we're here today to defeat the bad guys <laughs> yeah. it's always it's always delightful to run into writers who are used to writing hot and tight mm -hmm. because that is like it's its own craft yeah how to get like the most information across as quickly and as simply as possible. And witty and in character. And it's yeah. like, that is really hard to yeah. do. And so that's charming when that's happening. Yeah. I think that's why you and I wanted to sit down and continue talking about this stuff. One, because we're both very passionate about it. But two, just to like talk about this invisible this invisible art like you're saying like it's that's a great way to put it yeah it's the invisible art yeah and it's and it's the fact why did we pick that one right <laughs> what the? why did we pick that one that's a dumb choice <laughs> the um <laughs> the fact that yeah it's 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 something that um, i don't want to know i don't want to say it's like underappreciated but it is it. it is wildly difficult it is sometimes taken for granted and it's and it, we're so passionate about it because if you do the if you do it right if everything comes together and if you're lucky enough you will have something that is in in i'm gonna get to sound like a douchebag right now but in my mind like that is this that is what humanity is we are a collection of stories like that's why we have the iliad and the odyssey and fucking cave drawings like these are how humans react to the world and yeah. view the world is in stories so when you have when you appreciate that when you're able to put something together in a sequence that resonates with people like I don't know anything that's much more powerful than that maybe music I think music wins <laughs> music they're both the same yeah. they're, they're composed designed entities that have structure yeah. it'd be like if someone was like oh like if can you make here's a saxophone can you make notes come out of it 
boop, 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 music. And it's like the same thing where someone That's came to you and said, hey, can you, can you write, can you write a thing? Yeah. It's like, no, there's a, there's, a, there's a form to this. There's a craft to this. And there's a reason why when you put all the notes together, you get a symphony. Yeah. And people can't, people aren't, people unless you're trained can't articulate why bad and good writing is the, what the difference is. Mm-hmm. Versus bad and good code simply doesn't work. Yeah. Right. Bad and good writing, you might not even know that they don't work or be able to articulate the difference. So we're all the way up there at that abstract. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, hopefully this conversation has been somewhat helpful to people. But it has been interesting because we wanted to sit down and talk about like our experiences, but also obviously like what it means to write for game narratives and also just what it's been like to work on AAA games as well. So hopefully this has been helpful in some way. Um, I want to... In, at least interesting. <laughs> at least interesting. Yeah. I would be interested to... Um, in comments and like what people would like to hear about because I want to always nerd out on the craft itself. Yeah. I want to talk about world building and how to world build and yeah. I want to talk about how to you know break story and all that because when I was learning I was always it was ravenously looking for that stuff. And yeah. it was, I would eat up all the different and I'm, um, talks I'm, on it. I'm sure you and I, you know, you and I both talk very fast and we throw a lot of words out that I feel like some people may be like, I don't know what they're saying. What they saying? <laughs> so they keep using that word. Do they know what that word even means? I don't know what that means. They keep saying why now and therefore but. I don't know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> but those are the fun terms to talk about. Like yeah. I think there's, it's weird when you're reading, like let's say you read Robert McKee's storybook. Which you should read. If you're interested at all in what we've talked about, read Robert McKee's story. Just go right now and go. <laughs> like it's a great opening stuff. But until you're practicing in a writer's room with all these story, oh, do you have one? Look at you, sponsor. Oh, I love that. I've actually book. went to his. I went to his thing twice. It's so good. Yeah. Um, but it's like those words. It's very gratifying when you get into a writer's room and people are talking in these terms and doing these concepts, right? It's nice to have people, you know, worrying about is that you know how do we get you know talking about and crafting an inciting incident? Yeah. Right, talking what is, about what is an inciting incident? Yeah, yeah. and like, what is it, what's the why now? Because it's used. You use that to make the story. Yeah, um, and the same is true of all the stuff like character motivation. Like, well, why would they do that? And how does this? Like, you're constructing all these logical elements that are in this ether, right? It's a it's a invisible puzzle game. Yeah, but yeah, definitely let us know if there's um, whether there's certain stories that you're curious yeah. about or, or topics you want us to cover or if you just want us to talk more about what it's like to both work in game narrative but also game production you know all, both of us have had different experiences in game production as well and we're both still doing it yeah so. and bodybuilding if you want to know yes we uh, could just, well, we could just do obviously half videos. this channel is me eating protein bars and talking it about is it's pretty so. good <laughs> I, uh, I gotta get back at it harder <laughs> thanks everybody thanks guys bye see you next time <laughs>